Hey, thanks. Thanks, Christina. Hi, everybody. Uh, Joe Taborik here from Day2IQ, and uh, with me, our CEO, Toby Knaup, a longtime innovator and thought leader in, in cloud native. And we're going to kick it off here right with the headline, you know, for today's webinar, right? So the market is moving very fast towards this notion of smart, smart cloud native. And we realize we still run across people every day that are not familiar with the term. So we're going to start with the basics. So Toby, I'm going to start by a prompt for you and uh, T1 up for you, which is, can you describe smart cloud native uh, for those that are, have not yet, you know, been experienced uh, with it? Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining this webinar. Very excited to talk about uh, what Smart Cloud Native is. Um, we see that as an evolution of uh, cloud native applications. And essentially what Smart Cloud Native stands for, those are essentially cloud native applications that have AI capabilities built in. In a way where that AI is core to what the application does. So you can think about it as, as a digital product, a digital experience, that um, has AI capabilities and is also automatically improving, right? Uh, that's one of the key characteristics of a cloud native application is that we can continuously update it, deploy it uh, whenever we wanna make updates to that application. And um, I think those smart cloud native applications will be key to a lot of tomorrow's winning products. And here's some examples, right? So. We all use smartphones. We've used those for a couple of years and, and they have tons of AI capabilities built in, right? They have a spell checker. There's usually a photos app that automatically sorts our photos using AI. There's a digital assistant that's built in. Um, and all of those capabilities in the phones, they have, well, AI running in the phone, but they also have a component running on the cloud, right? That makes this product work. And that's an example of a smart cloud native application. Right? It's a cloud native app, it runs in the cloud and it has those AI capabilities. And if the AI is really core to what the thing does, right? Like if you take the AI out, it wouldn't be the same application. It wouldn't exist the same way, right? And so we're all familiar with that, right? Because we use smartphones all the time and some other examples that, that might sound very familiar, you know, self-driving cars, we talk a lot about those. They obviously have Capabilities and they're connected to the cloud too, right? So it's another example of a, of a smart cloud native app. And they also wouldn't exist without those uh, AI components. So those are some of the things that, you know, we're already talking about um, every day, but there's other examples like that of smart cloud native apps. I think literally every single industry uh, around the globe. Uh, here's one that I found recently that I think is really exciting, um, which is actually, putting AI into medical imaging devices, like CT scanners and MRI scanners and, and uh, ultrasounds, right? Those machines have always been very compute heavy, right? They, they need a lot of compute capabilities to do you know, 3D image uh, reconstruction and things like that. But they're now starting to use AI to, to just make those products better. There's some research, for example, it's called Fast MRI. Uh, where they're using AI to make MRI scans much, much faster, like four times faster, which means it's going to get cheaper. It's a better experience for the patient because, you know, you're not in that machine for as long. And, uh, you know, because the cost goes down, it's, it's going to be available for so many more folks and it's really just going to uh, increase patient outcomes uh, significantly. Other examples are smart cities, for example, and I think we're going to see a lot of that too um, for you know next generation of games, right? Like as augmented reality and and virtual reality come along, and you know games have uh, have been AI part for a long time. We'll we'll, we'll see that uh, in the gaming industry too, and then also some some places that you know as consumers we maybe don't see as much like you know, research. There's uh, uh, examples where it's been used for drug discovery and things like that. So I I think smart cloud native applications will really be pervasive and uh, revolutionize pretty much every industry around the globe. And I think tomorrow's winning products, you know, the products that we'll get most excited about in whatever industry they're in, they will all be powered by these, these smart cloud native applications. Now I talked a little bit about the characteristics of a smart cloud native application in the beginning and they have AI at the core. Uh, it's um, what, um, it's a defining attribute of those. And then, they have the same sort of characteristics that 
every cloud native application has, right? They're continuously deployed. Um, that's important so I can you know, add capabilities to that app um, all the time. They're dynamically managed by a cloud native platform. They tend to be pretty data intensive because AI is data intensive, right? So they process a lot of data. And, um, and typically that data is in real time, right? It, it uses data that's coming in in real time. And because of that, because they process so much data and the data is usually real time, those smart cloud native apps also tend to be deployed both on the cloud where you do your machine learning training, your AI training, as well as on the edge, which is typically where the new data comes in, right? From phones, from cars, from manufacturing equipment. That's another use case for smart cloud native apps is in, in smart manufacturing. That's where the new data comes in. So you need to architect those applications in a way where they can run both on the edge and on the cloud. Um, so that's what smart cloud native applications are. So Joe, you work with a lot of organizations, um, you know, enterprises around the globe. Why should an organization transition to smart cloud native applications? Yeah, good question, Toby. Um, well, you know, first, just to review the benefits of cloud native, and then we're talking about, you know, what does this AI capability add to that, right? So I think the, the benefits of cloud native generally many of uh, the folks in our audience may be familiar with, but to recap that, right, you've got ease of management, all of a sudden you're able to release uh, your applications and your capabilities much more quickly, so you have better release velocity. These applications are now highly resilient in this architecture, right? And in the cloud, especially with hyperscale and self-healing infrastructures are now available to you, and they're portable. The applications on those workloads are portable, right? So the question really then becomes, okay, so what's the uplift or what's the added benefit of smart cloud native and these AI capabilities, right? So you talked a bit about data. We've got massive data growth and proliferation, right? So they, they say data is the new oil, but are you leveraging the data that you have to provide your customers the experiences they want? right? At the end of the day, this is all about our, our customer experiences. And that's the differentiation that can be built by infusing AI into your business applications and these customer experiences that ultimately drive your revenue and service your customers, right? So what's powering this next wave of experience is the combination of data, you know, business, your business logic, right? Your traditional application and AI to get those experiences in the hands of your customers more quickly. And again, back to providing the differentiation for your business, right? And help you compete. And for you operators out there, you combine that with the ability to deploy these applications to multi-cloud environments, including edge in a consistent way with a platform like ours, for instance, um, you know, amplifying your reach to more customers while you're minimizing your complexity and costs, right? As well as taking out risk of getting to production or scaling that out to, to large workloads over time. So um, the benefits actually come back to differentiation, velocity, and the agility that that smart cloud native comes uh, comes with smart cloud native and the AI capabilities in that uh, are absolutely key to the experiences of tomorrow. You know, there's no doubt about that. Absolutely, and and you know, you and I I think agree that you know while smart cloud native is something really new, uh, it's a relatively new use case for um, you know for Kubernetes and for smart cloud for cloud native. Um, we also think that organizations really need to act fast and transition to these smart cloud native applications. Why should folks act now versus wait a little bit until the market matures? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, there are certainly some customers that have not, uh, or some organizations that have not embarked on the journey, but the reality is uh, it's not early, right? We don't need to wait till the market matures. You actually just gave a couple of examples, but these tailored experiences are all around us, right? The technology has already matured to a point where it's no longer a science experiment. Uh, whether it's consumer experiences like, you know, Netflix is recommending what you want to watch uh, or Amazon recommending what to buy. Those have been here for years, right? Those are great examples of smart cloud native applications and they've proven their value, right? You could see that in those organizations and their case studies, uh, the increases in revenue, customer loyalty, stickiness of, of those customers and so on. Um, so you get to this point where you realize just the leaders in your industry are already doing this, right? So as an example, you know, we've got a customer that's, a cruise line that's running their passenger experiences on their cruise ships, right where those passengers are closest to the data. And they've built these digital experiences that are incredibly responsive and tailored to their customers, these folks that are, are taking a cruise, um, which in turn drives 
additional revenue, like while you're out to sea, you know, do you want to buy this excursion or, you know, add on these, these packages to your experience? And it increases not just revenue then, but, you know, again, the lifetime value and the overall experience and loyalty from those customers. So um, the leaders in this industry, we've named a bunch already, are already doing it. If you're a bit later and you're chasing your competition, so think, you know, you're building the next generation of electric vehicles, you're, you may have a traditional 100-year-old old business, but you're chasing Tesla in this aspect of electrifying your lineup. Um, you're aggregating and processing data from many sources in the vehicle all of a sudden, right? So cameras, radar, light, LIDAR, and you need onboard AI to make real-time decisions of all that. But you also now need to provide these connected car experiences and insights to enhance you know, your ultimate driving experience. So um, you know, there's situations where I'm sure many of you are leaders in your industry, and many of you are you know, the, the car company trying to catch, you know, Tesla, to use that analogy. So, you know, why now is partly that if you're not already doing this, frankly, you're late and you're slipping behind your competition. And it's economic in that, like, the delayed or the foregone revenue increases in customer loyalty have not yet been obtained by your customer, right, or by your company, right? So really, the time is now. I don't feel like um, the technology has is, is certainly been here for long enough to, to uh, take advantage of. And um, the time really is now from you know, the as that aspect, yeah. Um, so for those that have not yet experienced it here, Toby, you know, there's gotta be some challenges with this, right? And even some of these mature companies like the Netflix and the Amazons and the cruise lines, uh, they have uh, been on this journey and they've experienced challenges. And we work with many of these world's world leading organizations. And so we've seen some of those challenges for them, you know, firsthand. Uh, but maybe you can spend a minute just talking about you know, it's not all motherhood and apple pie, as they say, right? There's got to be some bumps in the road. There's got to be a learning curve. You're dealing with new technologies, new processes, and so on. So maybe spend a minute talking about, you know, what challenges will our folks experience on their journey to smart cloud native apps? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think it's a good, you know, a reminder that, well, Native in and of itself poses challenges for organizations that are just adopting it, right? That are new to it, because it really isn't just, a new technology, it's also a new, you know, philosophy, it's a new way to build apps and, and go about deploying them and managing them. So I, I've seen a lot of times that the biggest hurdle that folks need to overcome is just that organizational change that they need to go through, you know, upskill their teams to learn this new way of doing things, you know, deploying every day instead of once a year. So, so you have those challenges already just around cloud native, you know, it's a fairly complex set of tools um, you know, you need to look at uh, automating a lot of things and so forth. So, but on top of that, the smart cloud native applications, you know, that AI piece that they introduce poses a lot of um, additional challenges. And, uh, you know, spoiler alert, there are solutions to those challenges, but I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll highlight some of the, the largest ones here. So, you know, first of all, um, the workloads that you're going to be running to build a smart cloud native application uh, they're fairly complex. Most folks, when they start out building a cloud native app, you know, you run some microservices. That's usually what people do first. They tend to be stateless microservices, at least in the beginning. That's where you start. So they're stateless microservices, fairly easy to manage in the whole spectrum of, of workloads out there. And then, you know, folks go to things like adding, you know, continuous integration and delivery capabilities, also fairly easy to manage in the whole spectrum of things. But AI workloads really are, are more complex. Um, they're complex for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, for many organizations, uh, those are new types of workloads. They've never ran those, those types of things uh, in production before. Um, and so in terms of their life cycle, they, they are more operationally complex. You also need a lot of different workloads. So to build an AI ML capability, you need to build um, what's generally called um, a machine learning pipeline or an AI pipeline, um, much like a continuous integration and delivery pipeline. So meaning you have a whole set of tools that you need to deploy and, and really that need to work well together to allow your data scientists to, you know, first of all, get access to the data wherever it may be living, then have an environment where they can develop the models. Um, that's usually a notebook like Jupyter notebooks um then provide them with the infrastructure and the right tools to train their models and then optimize them tune them deploy them monitor them right so there's a whole set of tools it's usually 
you know, way over a dozen of different uh, workloads that you need to manage on top of what you've been doing before, right? Running your microservices and running your data services. So typically dozens of workloads um, to build that end-to-end -end solution. So really complex workloads, it's a lot of them and they have fairly complex life cycles. That's definitely a challenge, these new workloads that are, that are introduced by AI. The next challenge is really around the data. Um, we talked about this in the beginning a little bit that these applications tend to be very data heavy, right? Which means in turn, they consume a lot of resources. Um, training machine learning models uh, in particular requires not just a lot of you know, storage and data to, for your data sets that you're training on, but also a lot of compute to train those models, right? And typically you need expensive compute resources like GPUs or other machine learning optimized silicon to do that. And it's not just that you need um, a large amount of compute, but you also need to manage that compute elastically. It's typically the way these load patterns look is, you know, you have your data scientists, they, they iterate on a model, now they want to train it. Um, and, and one thing that is, um, you know, kind of kind of unique to AI training is if you compare it to you know building software when you when you do a software build and usually you do a very small number of builds like let's say you you know you build for two or three different platforms so you have two or three different builds but when you train an ai model you want to do what's called hyperparameter optimization so you're often building dozens or hundreds or even thousands of versions of a model so very very large compute requirements and that demand is elastic right you may have at certain times a day a lot of data scientists building new models and then it dies down and the load goes almost to zero. So you actually need a system that can help you manage those resources dynamically, right? Pen pending on demand and schedule those, those different training jobs uh, in an optimized way for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, again, those resources are expensive. So you wanna make sure you don't uh, blow through your budget, but at the same time too, you want to allow data scientists to be able to iterate quickly, right? You don't want them to wait for those builds forever. So you also want to make sure nobody's blocked. So there's quite a bunch of challenges around that, around you know managing the compute and the storage for these workloads. And then, you know, related to that, um, you're talking about data. Security comes into play too. It's obviously something that should be. Um, you know, a, a priority from, from right out of the gate, um, as soon as you're starting to build an application for production. But data adds another layer of complexity there for, for security, right? How do you keep that data secure? You know, there's customer data in there and things like that. So that's another, another consideration. And then we talked about how workloads are becoming more complex in smart cloud native apps. We talked about the data uh, heavy nature of it and the complexity that introduces. It also poses new challenges for the infrastructure underneath. So how you run Kubernetes, how you run your infrastructure. And the reason is simply that a lot of these smart cloud native apps need to run in different places, right? We talked about the fact that most new data originates at the edge, but you know, for training those models, um, we need the cloud. We need the scale of the cloud so we can train those models. So now you have to architect your infrastructure in a way where it can run in these different places on the edge and in the cloud. And you know, how do you do that in a consistent way um, is another challenge. And so you know, to, to finish things out, I think um, the thing that's, that, that's important to realize, you know, maybe for the folks that have worked with machine learning and, and AI for, for a little while, one thing that's, that's unique here too about smart cloud native apps is that those AI components, you need to treat them as production services, as online services, right? We've done machine learning and data science um, for a long time, but in the past, typically those workloads were sort of used for, you know, offline batch processes, or, you know, you run some kind of model on, on a piece of data and spits out a report, and then you analyze that report sort of offline. But now again, because those AI capabilities are part of a user facing, customer facing application, you need to treat those things as highly available online services, right? You need to learn how to operate that way with everything that, that comes along with that, right? Like how to make changes to it without taking it down. How do I manage um, the load around it? Make sure it responds quickly and things like that. So all those 
you know, production considerations that yet you would have about any online service. And then lastly, a challenge is uh, talent, right? I think everyone's feeling sort of, um, you know, the talent crunch, it's difficult to find talent around cloud native. Well, now, since we're talking about more complex workloads that adds, you know, additional a strain there because you need that that uh, talent that knows how to how to do this. So those are some of the challenges. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks. There's um, actually a question really relevant. Um, a point ago, you were talking about you know highly available online services, and there's you know, the first question we have. And, and thanks again to to the audience for throwing questions into the Q and A for us. First one is right on that point. Um, the attendee asks, how critical would a server or cloud outage? B, in, in affecting smart cloud native applications. If this is critical, what are some of the methods to prevent that risk? Can you talk a little bit about the architecture from that standpoint? Excellent, yeah, that's a, it's a great question. So uh, right on that point, yeah, you need to architect just right out of the gate for high availability, right? We have some best practices around how to do that for cloud native applications, right? And that's one of the things that cloud native architecture and Kubernetes is really good at. Um, if you, you know, use the primitives in there, you will have high availability, right? You lose one instance of the application or your underlying server or cloud instance fails, Kubernetes will make sure that, you know, that instance gets deployed somewhere else and, and you still have enough uh, capacity available. So you benefit from that if you architect, you know, those applications on, on top of Kubernetes and using, using cloud native. Um, that's, a, that's a really good point. So, and yeah, what are some methods to prevent this? Um, basically following the same sort of best practices around deploying any cloud native app. Yeah, great question. Yep, thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. All right. I talked a lot about challenges um, and, uh, you know, we kind of hinted at that in the beginning already, you know, that adopting cloud native or smart cloud native in particular too, um, it's not just a new technology, but it also requires organizational change. So. Joe, can you talk a little bit about how roles are changing on teams, right? Like what's changing for developers, what's changing for operators and the other personas involved? Yeah, right on. So look, in adopting, you know, new tech or approaches, we always think about it in terms of not just the technology, right? But the people and the processes needed in order to be successful. So as IT leaders, you're thinking about people, process and technologies in these fundamental shifts in the way that you design, develop, deploy, run, you know, new application architectures like smart cloud native. So in this move, you know, you're again seeing the need for all three, right? To adapt to new approaches and development, deployment, and operation uh, to be successful, right? So broadly speaking, right? The two common personas, you know, if we just kind of boil it down to, to two, it'd be, you know, we got the developers and the operators, teams responsible for developing applications and teams tasked with running them in production. Um, and with the advent of DevSecOps and GitOps, these roles are already becoming blurry, right? And many of your organizations may already be down the path from a DevOps or DevSecOps standpoint. Um, there's a lot more collaboration and a lot more communication required, frankly, here in this new world. And with the rise of MLOps, so machine learning operations, in the AI domain, solutions you know, need to cater to additional personas like the data scientists or the data engineers. And so you have you know, even more necessity, you know, to break down some of those silos. Um, operators now are increasingly tasked with the objective of minimizing the complexity for developers, right? Providing those developers with new and interesting services to help them get their jobs done, right? Like serverless and functions, so they can abstract, you know, infrastructure constructs. And a common effect of building smart cloud native applications and adopting GitOps or DevSecOps practices is the this, we talk about this disintegration of, of silos within the organization, right? We work, Toby and I work with a 150 year old traditional financial services company, right? Very um, mainstream in that regard. They've had to actually reorganize all of these teams um, from a highly matrixed kind of format, the way things used to be. And as they developed a smart cloud native approach, you know, broke down those silos, did a complete reorg and aligned their teams for higher agility, faster releases and so on. So, you know, you have a world where, you know, now developers continue the sense of ownership all the way through production. And uh, you've got teams, frankly, meeting other teams inside their own four walls that they've never worked with before this closely. So the, the roles are changing, the walls are coming down and, it's, and it means really um, interesting, you know, things in terms of the way that we work together as humans, but also just the agility that that um, opportunity you know, presents for the business. 
Um, you know, maybe you can expand on a couple of those concepts, Toby. I know we're kind of sticking to smart cloud native, but you know, think about you know GitOps uh, in that regard or DevSecOps. Your thoughts there? Yeah, I think you know GitOps is a is a really cool approach, really cool concept that we you know always recommend to our customers. Um, and it's really, you know, for those folks who are not familiar with it, um, you know, we we've had this this phase in the past where you know sort of the best practices around DevOps were around you know infrastructure as code and things like that. Um, and and typically what that meant is that as an an operator, as an operations person you would automate your infrastructure in terms of runbooks, right? So you would write some code that executes certain steps to make change to the infrastructure. And, uh, but typically you run that as a human or if it's executed by, um, by some software, it, it, it's still sort of this, um, you know, iterative step, uh, iterative steps that you need to execute. And if any of these steps fails, then the whole runbook fails and you need to go in and debug it and, and so forth. Now what's great about GitOps is um, a couple of things. So first of all, it's um, the interface that you use in order to make changes to your infrastructure is Git, version control system that I think most of us use these days. So it's a very familiar tool. And so, you know, to make changes to your infrastructure, you basically just check in changes to your your configuration right which often there's a yaml files that describe um, what you want your infrastructure to look like so declarative um declarative configuration which um of course that's one of the great things about uh, kubernetes that it introduced is those declarative apis for describing what your infrastructure looks like and um so to make changes you just you just check in um, a different different version of your declarative spec and uh, in fact, recently, you know, with the introduction of cluster API, for example, we we can just extend the scope of um, of what we can control with declarative specs, right? So with, with cluster API, for example, we can declaratively define what our infrastructure clusters look like. And you know, with some of the products like um, Kubeflow, which is the basis of our uh, Captain machine learning platform at Data you can take that all the way up to the machine learning workloads that I talked about as being so complex, right? So you can declaratively describe those two and then use Git to make changes to it. Now, what happens in between? Well, you know, you might be wondering, well, I'm checking in those changes and I have those declarative APIs, who makes the changes, who executes those? Well, it's software, right? So we have uh, another key concept in Kubernetes, which is controllers, a piece of software that basically tries to reconcile the desired state that you declared in your Git repository in this case, with you know the actual state of the cluster and the workloads, right? So you have software doing that instead of, again, a human executing a script with a couple of different steps, which makes it a lot less error prone. And uh, you can build in things for you know recovering from failure automatically and things like that. So what that leads to ultimately is better service outcomes, right? Higher availability, less downtime, all of those things, which is extremely important, again, because we're talking about some very complex workloads here in complex environments. So, you know, the more complex those environments get, the more difficult it is to do that the old way um, using, you know, scripts and, and GitOps and the declarative APIs and really give you a way to like automate that and make it uh, build a system that's a lot less uh, error prone, a lot more resilient. And I think you know what we could talk about at this point too is uh, uh, maybe maybe talking a little bit about um, the infrastructure versus the application, right? So I, I just talked a lot about um, you know declarative APIs and how you make changes to the infrastructure. That's obviously you know we're talking about um, what an operator does and a cluster operator. Um, well, we're talking about machine learning workloads here uh, for smart cloud native apps. So there's an, another persona here involved, right? Uh, which is the machine learning engineer or the data scientist, right? That's that's building models. And you know, you may be wondering if I'm a data scientist, if I'm a machine learning engineer, you know, I don't really want to deal with GitOps and I don't want to deal with declarative APIs, right? I don't want to run write YAML. I just, you know, I know Python, I know my machine learning development frameworks. That's kind of all I want to do. So how can we provide this persona um, an environment that feels native to them where they don't have to you know know everything about kubernetes and you know learn all the ins and outs 
um, one of the ways we solve that in, in our Captain product is, uh, you know, using a Python SDK that allows you to actually interact, you know, with uh, with the underlying infrastructure. It allows you to easily train a model and and uh, deploy a model and and tune the hyperparameters and so forth. Which again, there's a lot that happens behind the scenes to make that make that happen. You know, cluster will probably auto scale up to have enough resources and things like that. But it's kind of all abstracted away from from the data scientists, they can just do that in their notebook environment, in a Jupyter notebook using Python. Um, so I think that's a really, you know, important tool too to um, just create um, an environment that's that's friendly to to a data scientist or to a machine learning engineer. Hey Toby, we've got a couple of questions on this point actually. So can we mm -hmm. just um, you know spend another minute on actually the tech stack itself? So there's a couple of questions that are pretty related here from the audience. One's around, hey, just go through kind of the stack, containers, Kubernetes. AI, ML, like, is, is it always all of these pieces? And the other one's very related is, you know, can you take me through kind of the conceptual technical stack to enable these smart cloud native applications? Can you just spend a minute on kind of what the stack looks like and, you know, the breadth and depth of, you know, what might be involved in that? Very good question. Yeah. So we'll start right at the bottom, right? Um, which is uh, the hardware, the infrastructure, right? So we'll, we talked about those applications often running on edge and cloud, right? So on the cloud, you know, you rent your machines from your cloud favorite cloud provider. Um, and those machines typically run Linux, right? Most um, cloud native applications are running on Linux. You can do Windows too, but, you know, especially for uh, machine learning, um, that typically happens on Linux. So, you know, you rent your machine there, you have Linux on top, your favorite Linux distro. Um, on the edge, um, the hardware is kind of interesting. Um, you kind of see all kinds of things. Folks often deploy, you know, ARM-based, you know, small size um, boxes. You know, you're talking about four cores, um, you know, four to eight gigs of RAM, something like that. Um, but depending on the use case, those things can be a little bigger too. Um, those can be hardened x86 servers. So, you know, they're a little bigger. Maybe they have 16 cores, 32 cores, something like that. Um, but they are, because they're deployed on the edge, you know, typically they don't sit in a data center that has, you know, AC and, you know, um, air filters uh, to create a, um, um, sort of a controlled environment. They often are deployed on the manufacturing floor. And so they need to be industry, uh, you know, hardened machines. So that's what the hardware looks like. Um, and again, you'd be running Linux on top of that too. The next layer up is Kubernetes, right? Um, you standardize on Kubernetes for, for these applications. And, um, and then Kubernetes is sort of your substrate, your, your abstraction layer that sort of makes all the infrastructure underneath look the same wherever it may be running. So then on top of that, um, you run, as Joe mentioned in the beginning, you have your business logic, you have your data applications, and then you have your AI applications for you know, your business logic and, and your microservices, you can build those in, in whatever programming language you want. You just stuff them in a container, right? That's the nice interface we have here, whatever programming language you're gonna use inside, just stuff it in a container, we can run that on Kubernetes. Um, the data services that we often see involved here are things like Kafka, uh, because again, a lot of these applications are real time, so you need a way, uh, a real time data pipeline and then, you know, databases that can scale to, uh, you know, the amount of resources, the amount of data that you're processing here, like Cassandra, for example, or the equivalent cloud services. Um, and then for, for the AI ML pipelines, um, the, the workloads that we see most commonly are Jupyter Notebooks. So that's a development environment for, for data scientists. Um, then the two most popular Machine learning development frameworks are TensorFlow and PyTorch. So we see that a lot, so both written in Python um, or they have Python interfaces rather. So that's where people develop their models. Um, and then, you know, as you go later into the AI ML pipeline, um, there's different tools involved um, for, for hyperparameter tuning. Each of those Python frameworks has a way to deploy their models. There's TF serving for TensorFlow, for example. Um, so that, um, that's typically the stack. There's many other pieces, you know, could talk for hours about, you know, what you should do for networking and for storage and for security. There's many, many other pieces that, uh, that exist sort of on, um, around this, but those are kind of the core components. So if you're gonna, for the first time, 
deploy a cloud native application and you don't have one yet deployed in containers and running on Kubernetes, how many different technologies are we talking about here, Toby? Yeah, it's so for just a cloud native app without any smart, without any AI, um, you're already talking over a dozen, right? Um, probably uh, 20 or so different open source technologies that need to come together to build a production grade stack. Um, that's a lot, right? It's a lot of different tools um, to uh, to think about, and and we'll, we'll talk about you know what what some approaches are to kind of calm that chaos um, and, and how to go about that. But then you add the smart component, um, you know, you you're immediately kind of doubling almost, I would say, you know, adding another dozen or two other workloads to make that happen. Yeah, it's it's an incredibly complex um, environment, but massive opportunity and upside to getting it right. Mm -hmm. So it's a probably a good segue. Like we wanted to talk, spend some time talking about what recommendations we would have. And without, you know, given time constraints, without doing that technical deep dive, um, let's move into like this topic around, you know, what recommendations you'd have for the team here, Toby, today, you know, maybe keep it, do, maybe you hit some of the technology centric stuff. I could hit maybe some of the people in process at a high level, but I'm cognizant, you know, we're looking at the clock too, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the great things about um, Cloud Native, of course, is that it's all based on open source software, right? And why is that great? Well, because the open source community, especially, you know, the Cloud Native community um, just innovates so fast. Right, the speed of innovation is incredibly high, and so we talked in the beginning about how important it is to adopt, you know, smart cloud native now because others are already doing it. And so, if you don't act now, you're going to be behind. Well, if that's true, then one of the best ways to, you know, catch up if you haven't started yet or to get ahead um, in smart cloud native and AI is to also commit to open source for those AI pieces, right? So leverage the best of breed open source technologies for the entire stack, right? We start with Linux at the bottom, we go to Kubernetes, those are both open source. And then those key technologies I talked about for AI, Jupyter, TensorFlow, PyTorch, so forth, all open source, right? So that's like your guaranteed best way to, to be at the forefront of innovation. You need to choose a smart cloud native platform that helps you run all these things, right? So we talked a lot about the challenges earlier, how complex those workloads are and so forth. So you need a platform that first of all can support these AI workloads, and that runs in all these environments we talked about, right? Edge, multi-cloud, air-gapped environments, if that's something you need to do. Um, we see that a lot in manufacturing, for example. Um, and so you need a platform that does that, that has a high degree of automation built in, because again, there's a lot of complexity. So you wanna automate as much as possible to get resiliency and, and just tame that complexity. You also wanna look at, um, a platform that can use AI and ML itself to help you operate better. It gives you operational insights that makes recommendations to you. How kind of, you know, it's your sort of sidekick as a human operator to, uh, to help you run uh, more successfully. And then, you know, related to, to going with an open source strategy, right? You want to pick a platform that's built from the best of breed open source components and kind of aligns with where the community is headed, right? Where the CNCF ecosystem and communities headed because that's where the uh, the innovation is happening you want to take advantage of that to do that you need to find the right partner right um, you want to find an organization that can help you support this that integrates all these pieces and tests all these pieces uh, for you provide support and training and so forth and um, I think uh, to pick up a point again that I, that I mentioned earlier um, you need to architect for production from day zero, right? Like these AI workloads are different from what we've done in the past. And so you really need to treat everything like a production system and, uh, you know, kind of use all the best practices that we know from running microservices and other cloud native workloads also for these AI uh, workloads. So that's what I would say around, you know, the technology, the choices um, are, are sort of the best practices. And, you know, Joe, maybe you can expand on, on people should think about people and processes. Yeah, there's actually a couple of questions that are on this point. So instead of kind of talking through that in, in depth, I, I'll just maybe address that in the trying to answer a couple of the team's questions here. Um, the first question on kind of the process is, um, as applications get more complex, it's harder for uh, ops and those teams to manage. There's more to go wrong. 
do you see or expect a big uptick in management time for the operations teams when smart cloud native apps are deployed, right? So this really does go to people, teams, uh, structure, process, and so on. Um, I would say the opportunity is Toby was just outlining that tech stack while Toby just simplified it. I think he also said there's two or three dozen uh, you know, new and innovative technologies that need to come together, right? Need to be integrated and delivered mm -hmm. as a platform. And so the opportunity is certainly there for the operations teams to deal with all that complexity, to have to integrate things themselves. Uh, because remember, uh, most all of those three different dozen technologies were not built to work with each other. They don't come pre-integrated out of the box. Hence, uh, a value proposition around day two IQ and others. Um, so the opportunity for complexity is certainly massive, but I would say automation is, on the other hand, the key to you know that answer. Um, you need to embrace a GitOps approach. You need to embrace a platform that automates all of that stuff and simplifies your day two operations. And therefore, you know we actually see very large customers of ours, very high scale, with lots of applications already have been deployed with minimal like two, three, four person operations teams. And the reason they're able to do that is through automation, right? So I would say um, most uh, of our customers love to start their journey by experimenting with these dozens of technologies. Um, you very quickly learn that uh, as you start putting applications in production, there's no way a team of single digit people will be able to, to manage all that without automation. So I'll, I'll answer that that way. And the other question that was on topic was, um, how can I get my teams excited about this newer way of developing, deploying, and managing smart cloud native applications? How is the culture different than traditional IT app dev deploy manage? I think that's an interesting you know, question. It, it goes towards uh, culture and, and a, few of, a few other things. Um, I, we talked earlier about, or I did about you know, alignment you know, internally and breaking down some of those silos. I also think that there's an opportunity for us as technologists to talk to the business side of our organizations around, hey, how can I help the company you know, deliver their revenue ambitions? How do I help the company deliver customer loyalty and that, that the business teams are trying to accomplish, right? And at the end, that's what uh, most sales, uh, marketing, services, digital executives in your organization are looking to accomplish. And so there's a huge opportunity about um, of having more traceability and line of sight into how you as individual developers or operators can directly map to your customer, your company's success in the marketplace. So I think that you know, embracing that conversation and knocking down some of those silos, I think frankly invigorates people when whether you're a developer or an operator, understanding where you fit, understanding the value that you're providing uh, to the company in whole is, is an exciting thing. And I think the second way you get ex teams excited about it is, you know, you've got several dozen new technologies that are on the forefront of where digital innovation is today and what developers and operators are considering to be best in class, right? So um, the, the uh, gaining of new skills, right? Uh, to all of the individual teams from development to, to operators is a huge opportunity. And I think, you know, we've seen most of our customers look at this as a way to really fulfill a lot of their personal, you know, ambitions around staying current with technology and always being able to have some time to, to play and also run, um, you know, the technologies that are on the forefront of innovation. And I think that, you know, that's a huge motivator for folks. So I, I would look at those two avenues as a way to, to get your teams excited about this new way, right? This, these new smart cloud native applications. Okay. Um, Absolutely. So as we start, you know, moving our way towards a wrap up um, here, and, and again, we really appreciate the questions and the times. There's probably a, a few more other questions we'll try to get to here in, our, in a race to the finish line. But um, again, our, our final kind of point of view on smart cloud native is, you know, the time is now, right? We believe these smart cloud native apps are these digital experiences that by definition are powered by, by AI and they're constantly evolving and improving, right? The cycle times uh, that this architecture allows you to have reduces you know, application releases from months to potentially hours, to days or hours, right? So there's a huge opportunity there. And it, these will be the defining attributes of tomorrow's you know, winning digital products, right? In every industry. Um, you know, Toby, you know, wrap, wrap up from there and I'll talk a little bit about, you know, who Day2IQ is since we didn't start with that, but, you know, any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I think, I think that was a, that was a good summary. I think, um, you know, again, it's, 
um, we believe that those those types of apps will be part of the leading solutions in every single industry. So, you know, really, if you want to be a leader in your category, it's it's time to to get uh, started with that. Um, others are already doing it, right? Chances are there, there's a player in your category that's already adopting this and building applications that have AI built in. Uh, so, so the time is now. And um, you know, I think since we're talking here in the context of the, the Linux Foundation, right, and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, you're already in the right place, right? Adopt open source, use open source to do this because that really helps you innovate faster uh, than, than going the alternative route. Yeah, yeah great, great point. Um, so a little bit about day two IQ for your folks. Um, so if you're not familiar with us, we have a long history. In fact, Toby is one of the three co-founders of the company going back nine years, helping enterprises and governments around the world with their journey to cloud native and now smart cloud native. Um, our platform called DKP simplifies the challenges of day two operations, and it provides the automation that you know, solves all of those challenges around the, the complexity of these new tech stacks. So we help customers that are just getting started on that journey through the platform, but we also help them with our services teams that can offer uh, help to you in the form of CNCF certified training and professional services so that your organization can ultimately become self-sufficient um, and experts in your own journey. Uh, for those that are already down the path and been doing this for a while, um, we are quite experienced in intermediate and advanced use cases like running these AI enabled smart applications uh, in multi-cloud uh, in edge where it's even frankly more difficult um, than, than it, it is when you're getting started. And finally, we're complementary to, and we partner with the likes of AWS and Microsoft and NVIDIA for AI and others so that we can embrace and extend the investments you've already made in cloud and AI technologies. Uh, so we are, you know, a, a way to uh, certainly accelerate, you know, your path and your journey here towards smart cloud native applications, and we'd love to help you. Um, Toby, take us home, you know, final takeaways and any calls to action. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, since I imagine we have a couple of different folks here in the audience, different personas, you know, coming at this problem from different perspectives, um, <clears throat> and wondering, you know, how can I engage? How can I get involved in this? So depending on what your role is, very different ways to do that. Um, and there are a lot of open source projects around this, right? So if you're a data scientist, for example, you know, look at and get involved in those open source projects that cater to data scientists, right? Like Jupyter, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and, and so forth, right? If you're more on the operations side, get involved in open source projects that are more on the operations side, like Kubeflow, for example, right? Um, if you are looking for um, a partner, right? Like you've looked at this space and you've decided, well, I want to go the open source route, Right. Um, I want to embrace the best of breed open source technologies to give me that that speed of innovation. Find the right partner. Right. Um, our philosophy is uh, really we we cater to people like that who decided you know I'm going to build a step my stack based on the best of breed open source technologies. But you know I need a partner to help me with that complexity to help me you know test all the integrations and get you know sort of a a solution that I can use and, and download. Uh, that is fully tested and validated and integrated and supported. So, you know, go check out our website. We talk a lot about this there. Um, there were some questions in the chat too about diagrams, you know, how does this all fit together? Uh, we have that on our website under, under solutions. Um, and, um, you know, I would say, um, finally, we, uh, you can read our blog. We'll write a lot about smart cloud native apps on, on our blog. Um, if you go to day2iq.com, we actually have a, category so there's a direct link on the slide right now it takes you to that category of cloud native um or just go direct to our website d2iq.com and um you know finally we're hiring so if you want to help build uh you know one of the best platforms here for for running these smart cloud native apps based on open source check out our careers page so i think that takes us to the end we're right on time so thank you all for, for listening and, and for the great questions Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks everyone. This, is, uh, this has been fun. And Christina, back over to you. Well, great. Thank you so much to Toby and Joe for their time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. And we hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thanks everyone. Thank you.